Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Rollins, and welcome to our meet and greet uh, to uh, discuss Melanie Chardoff's new book, Odd Woman Out. And in a couple of minutes, Kitty Schaller, who, by the way, has done Herculean work to make all of this happen. Uh, in a couple of minutes, she's going to cover some of the technical details about using Zoom. But first, let's set, set stage for Melanie. getting such attention everybody gives a mention get a mansion get a pension i'm getting famous they follow me they swallow me fighting for a piece of me but my act is all they see I'm getting famous All this crap with people clapping Feeling scared of all that's happening Blame the fame for scaring life away Please love me not what I do Love me if I'm no one too Please see through my screen of fame and stay. Curtains drop around a hurt that no big name or money can set free. When all I wanted was for him to see how many others would love me. See, they love me, see, they love me, see, they love me. show my show so you won't know how lonely I'll be when you go boxed inside a TV show but getting famous my name is up in the neon lights too bright to get near in the night Fame smiles, days and sleeps in fancy silk designer label for rights. See, they love me, see, they love me, see, they love me. Won't you love me too? Who needs you? I'm getting I am recording this gathering so that the folks who weren't able to join us will be able to have it on the recording. So if you don't want to be on the recording, this is your time to make it in the lower left-hand corner, stop video, and your face will disappear. So, but other than that, um, we want you to mute yourselves. Everybody probably knows how to do that in the lower left-hand corner. Just click on mute and leave it there while we get started. Um, if you wanna make just a quick remark later on, all you need to do is press the, st the space bar and hold it down while you say a few words. But if you want for a longer remark, which we hope folks will do after Mel Melanie begins to read, just unmute yourself, wave your hand and Paul will call on you. Now, as far as a view goes, You'll know in the upper right-hand corner, it says view. You are able to choose either speaker view or gallery. Speaker makes it so that only one person at a time, usually the speaker, has the majority of the screen. That'll be nice, particularly for Melanie. Then you'll also have a scrollable view on the right-hand side. Just, just hit the down arrow and you'll see everybody that way. Or you can choose gallery view and that gives you the Hollywood squares um, approach to, to Zooming. Um, and as I said, and we will be muting everybody. So if you, um, if you wanna say something to someone, you can use the chat down below, make it a personal message by choosing their name. Just start typing the name you see on the screen under their, under their face, and you can, you can communicate that way. Um, I've already talked about how you can go to the second screen to see other folks who may not be on the first screen. 
Um, and now when we get ready to do this, we want a real interactive afternoon. So we're asking you to be thinking about when Melanie begins to speak, what it calls to mind, a question you might have, maybe an experience, a thought. Um, we want you to, to be able to voice that. And as I say, to do that, you'll unmute yourself and wave your hand at, at um, Paul and he'll call on you. I think everybody's renamed appropriately now. And I want to point out that Chuck um, Elkins is also hosting today. Um, if you have a problem, um, I'm going to put his phone number in the chat in a moment and you could send him a text and he'll try to give you a hand if you run into trouble later on. And I think that's it. Now we're back to Paul. Paul? Thank you, Kitty. So as you, as, uh, you know, this is kind of a celebratory event for uh, Melanie Chardoff's first book and we're gonna talk to her about that and about uh, other issues around her uh, career. And it's a special interest to me because I've known Melanie for 40 years. So some of the events in the book uh, I was a part of or I knew about. So we may interact uh, together talking about some of the adventures we've had. But first we wanna welcome Melanie Chardoff to our gathering and Melanie, come on down. Where are you? <laughs> Where is she? she on the other screen? <laughs> I'm here. Oh, there you go. I had to dress hey. up. Everybody looks so festive. I just could not be left out. So okay. Good thank deal. you everybody for coming. Thank you, Paul and Kitty and Chuck. It's great well, to be here. Super duper. So so welcome, welcome. And uh, uh, since, since you and I met on the wonderful uh, Friday's comedy show on ABC, I thought it was as good as Saturday Night Live. And that's where you and I met on the set of Saturday of uh, Fridays. So uh, how about starting us off with just telling us a little bit about what Fridays was and what your experiences were on that show. Well, Fridays was clone a clone a, as ordained by ABC of Saturday Night Live, which made all of us iconoclastic singular acts very uncomfortable. We didn't want to imitate Saturday Night Live. We wanted to invent something new. So we began with their sort of format. I was the newscaster. Other people played similar roles, types of roles, broad roles. And little by little, we evolved into our own style, uh, very avant-garde. Fridays premiered some of the greatest rock bands in the world. Uh, for example, the Boomtown Rats, The Clash, I think Devo premiered on Saturday Night Live and they joined us. So we were pretty much akin to Saturday Night Live's success at the time we went on. Uh, people sometimes mistook us for Saturday Night Live. They forgot what night it was. We were on Fridays. Uh, and we had all kinds of luminary, great stars. I was very honored coming from the stages of New York City to be working with all these incredible stars. You know, Madeline Kahn was one of our guest stars. Uh, we had politicians on, you know the drill. Anybody who was famous at that time was on our show. I was thrilled to meet Al Jarreau, who was one of my, my favorite singers at the time. Bonnie Raitt, got to hang out with her. And um, we just had some wonderful adventures aside from doing the show itself, which was live. So that meant there was no net. Any mistakes that happened were on air. As a matter of fact, Mary Edith, Edith Burrell, who lives in your neighborhood, Paul, in Asheville, yeah, lives in Asheville. Uh, was a cast member. And she um, and I had this sketch to do about violence in the home. What if people just hauled off and sopped each other when they lost their tempers? And I played her aging mother, about 80 years old. This is on YouTube if anybody wants to see it. I think it's called The Fight or Fighting Family. And we staged the fight and we staged my fall onto a mattress just under the stage uh, level. And in her zeal on the live show on that night, she actually connected and hit me in the jaw and I actually did what I was supposed to do, fell flat on my face on the floor. And then I was uh, bleeding and sucking it down. And of course it looked so real because it was real. And um, Mary Edith was just stricken with this small one inch error that she had made. And then they had us on Entertainment Tonight saying, what kind of cat fight is this? And I began to see how much sensationalism was around the show that um, controversy about the show was making it as big a hit as our talents were. So I had some mixed feelings about that. 
Andy Kaufman was a guest on our star, uh, on our show. He was on twice. And I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he had a way of creating very negative attention. And he um, made it clear at the beginning of the show that he was gonna be breaking out of the show. He was going to go into the fourth wall, which means talking right to the audience, breaking out of all our scenarios. And so the night of uh, his appearance, our producers warned us that he was gonna break out and we should just improvise the last scene with him because we didn't know what he was gonna do, stay in character. And that's what we did. And there was a fight between he and Michael Richards and I ran off the stage screaming and then the crew was about to leap on and beat him up. And this was all, um, this was all an improvisation but the audience really bought it. So of course this got us the highest ratings of all time. It was like the beginning of reality, reality TV um, in other words, and I wasn't happy about it, but it made us famous. It was bizarre. I remember it. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the scene, he says, I, it's, I don't want to do this. This is crazy. I don't even right. want to be in this scene. So right. it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there were several other people there Michael Richards and, uh, and, uh, and Larry David. Uh, Larry David, who went on to form. Uh, uh, Seinfeld and and uh, and curb your enthusiasm and uh, what was it like working with those guys? I remember R Michael Richard was, was really a physical comic, did a lot of crazy, really. Over the, yeah. Uh, Michael was um, highly physical. He could do pantomime. He could do acrobatics. He did remarkable things with his body. He would do anything for a laugh. Right. And they created this battle boy scenario between a, a little boy and his sister who are fighting, their imaginations are fighting for what to see their yard as, this tract home. Right. And of course he saw it as a battlefield for his soldiers. And I saw it as a romantic scenario for my dolls, picnicking uh, opportunities. So our, our, we had this clash of consciousnesses, which usually ended with him biting off the heads of my dolls or setting them on fire, which was <laughs> hilarious, of course, to the home audience. But um, those were some of the, the sketches we did as an ongoing theme that they were really fun. And Larry David, I had known since we were both stand-ups at the Improv in New York City. Um, so when he and I both got cast on the show, it was like having my cousin there. It was very comforting. Right. And um, he was a terrific writer. He went on from there to do the Saturday Night Live writing uh, uh, team. And from uh, there, he went on to create Seinfeld, which was uh, long in becoming a hit. It took a couple of wow. years for it to take off. And then Curb, he's like the new leader of the, of the Jews. You know, he's become sort of the new Jewish thought leader in America. He's become a hero. And he was such a depressive person. It was very hard for me to believe that that would happen. Huh. Huh. Well, uh, what about behind the scenes stuff that goes on in those shows? <laughs> any any gossip from those characters you worked with on Fridays and people who were on the show? Did any of them ever, famous people, were you intimidated when they came on? Or, oh, uh, yeah, but I, I learned a trick, you know. I had been on Broadway with some luminaries and um, I was often intimidated because mm -hmm. I came from a small town and you know, we were just middle class folks. And suddenly I was thrust into the limelight with people like Raul Julia. I had my first stage love scene on Broadway with Raul Julia and I was completely intimidated. And um, I had this way of saying curse words under my breath when I was meeting with somebody like Johnny <laughs> Carson or some of the big luminaries. And so um, it would give me confidence. I would be saying, you know, F you, it's wonderful to meet you. And that gave me like the courage that I needed to meet their eyes, oddly enough. It was my intervention. I think I'll try that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you already do that, don't you? I don't, I might already do that. <laughs> Listen, you know, one of the things you're really known for is, uh, is the voice of Dee Dee Pickles on Rugrats. And, uh, and that's a super popular thing. And how did that, how did that event come about, uh, that show come about? And how did you arrive at the voice of Dee Dee Pickle? Well, it was my first audition for an animated show. And when they described the character, it sounded like my own mother. So basically I ripped off my own mother's voice, which is similar to my voice, only a lot faster. And so I created the character of Dee Dee based on my own mother's anxiety and repressive energy. And uh, 
you know, I was able to put it through this animated creature and they became homogenized together and became a thing separate from me, which was just kind of wonderful. So I'm the original voice of Dee Dee Pickles and it's been a wonderful trip. I've been in three series and three movies based on the Rugrats. What I remember, uh, I remember uh, being with you at a very beginning of an animation. You may not even remember it, but you were in the sound booth and people were animating downstairs. Was that Rugrats? Yes, that was probably Rugrats. I have done other animated shows, but I think you came to visit when I was doing Rugrats. Yeah, it was interesting because the animators would sit in the booth watching us, watching how our faces moved, watching how our eyebrows moved, watching all the little ticks and and uh, tricks that we did vocally when we made faces as we spoke and they would, you know, animate us. They would use those in the storyboards before they, they drew the final pictures. So the, so which comes first, the voice or the animation? Well, on Rugrats, the voices came first and then they incarnated the characters based on our intonations and our innuendos, uh, which was wonderful. Subsequently, I've done a lot of cartoons on the Cartoon Network and other places where we have to lip sync to the drawings that have already been done, which I find more difficult. I really like being the one to generate the emotions, um, but it's a different world. I mean, I've also done animatronics where they've put electrical impulses on my face mm-hmm. and body so that it's like a ripoff of your soul. You know, they basically clone the actor energy for the, uh, the computer generated piece. Do you have to do anything to get into the voice like uh paint your face or look like Dee Dee Pickle or could you just do it? <laughs> no, I was born with this uh, voice with my mother. My mother's voice has always been with me, so it's no problem at all. And the good <laughs> thing for my mother was that with the residuals, I was able to buy her a condo. So right. she kept her mouth shut. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, another thing uh, uh, I experienced with you uh, when I came out to LA, uh, you, were, you were starring in March of the Falsettas. And I remember uh, sitting with, uh, uh, oh, I, do, I gotta tell you this. I remember coming to my seat and there were two other empty seats and, and in walked two of the other uh, uh, heroes of mine from Friday's show. And I spent, I spent the whole <laughs> evening after we went out to a bar doing improv with, uh, uh, what was his name? That crazy. Mark Blankfield. Mark Blankfield, yeah, it's great. So, uh, uh, so that was a terrific show. What, so what, how did that come about? And uh, we played a video of you in the beginning of your singing. And uh, how did the singing come about that got you into that show? And what was your experience of that? Well, my mom was a small town opera singer in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, always sang around the house. And she would get musical theater albums from the library and we would sing along. So that was in my, uh, my culture. I just love musical theater and I dreamed of being on Broadway. It's amazing, I made it to Broadway twice. It was such a dream and a lot of off-Broadway shows. So I had been singing for quite a long time. And while I was doing Fridays, they asked me to audition for a West Coast premiere of an East Coast success, which was called March the Falsettos. And um, they wrote a new song for me about having a nervous breakdown, which suited me because at the time I was getting kind of well-known and yet had no intimate friends. Paul became my first really good soulmate friend. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had this feeling of being extremely adored interpersonal, I mean, uh, impersonally by audiences and not having really any friends or any close contacts or family in Los Angeles I could relate to. So um, I was uh, becoming a celebrity and um, this was the first stage show I did as a celebrity. So I'm gonna read you a a short passage from a story called Homing In. Okay. Opening night telegrams and flowers were arriving when a large package festooned with multicolored ribbons was delivered to the stage door addressed to me. Strange sounds were emitting from it. So the guys and I tore off the wrapping paper to reveal a large birdcage containing a live carrier pigeon, a wheel of Gouda, and a bottle of Dom Perignon with a small bag of bird seed. I was baffled, but the overture for the show was starting, so we ran to the stage. As our opening night show wrapped to a standing ovation, we rushed upstairs to open the pricey champagne and to read the note attached to the cage. I'm a big fan and a humble farmer. I'm a big fan and a humble farmer. I own and operate my own ranch and brewery in Texas. 
here are photos of me on my property. I'll be bold and tell you I am looking for a wife to share my world. I have more than enough to share and to care for someone. I would enjoy coming along on your life too. I'm attending your sat Saturday matinee in eight weeks and I would like to take you to dinner. If you agree, write a note with your yes and attach it to the leg of this prize homing pigeon <laughs> inside the enclosed ring. Uh, if you are involved and prefer not to meet, just write no on the note and set her free to fly back to, to me. Either way, I know I will enjoy seeing you on stage. Have a good show. And it was signed respectfully, Dudley. Well, this was the most original attention getting fan mail I had ever received. It beat out the red nightgown sent by the crew of the nuclear sub, the USS Bremerton with submariners do it deeper emblazoned on the front and all the novel propositions I was getting from prisoners. But I was <laughs> not scared for any full court press, especially from some stranger bribing me with livestock. I already knew it would be a no, but delayed demurring because I was getting a loud yes from inside myself to this pigeon we named Midge. Midge became our show's good luck charm and my personal sedative, an organic element between all the trappings of theatricality and showbiz. We were still, however, one step removed from life. Over the next few weeks, she flapped less, she cooed more, and so did I, as she pecked away at her seed in her cage, first in my dressing room and on our days off in her vacation quarters at my apartment. After a five week delay, I broke it to the cast and crew that I would have to say no by bird to Dudley. I wrote no on the little note and I affixed it to the little ring on her little leg. I kissed her bouncy little head and leaned out the third floor window of my dressing room and I tossed her hard up into the air over the theater. We four hung out the window to watch her arc into the sky. She was so much bigger with her wings spread. Valiantly, she flapped hard, getting ballast on the wind, but then couldn't seem to soar aloft. We began to panic, cheering her on. And after struggling in midair, which for what seemed like an eternity, Midge simply stopped trying. And then she dropped, gathering speed and plummeting like a stone, pelting a Cadillac hood in the parking lot below. And we <laughs> screamed. A broken heap of Midge's plumage was all that remained. Uh -huh. Well, the show had to go on that day. There was no time for ceremony or sentimentality or tears, but the guys kept me company as I called Dudley's number on the payphone to break the news. He was so happy to hear from me until I told him of Midge's unfortunate death. He was silent for a time. She was my prized pigeon's second squab and her actual name was number three. She was used to regular exercise. No surprise, she didn't make it after five weeks sitting in a cage. I'm horribly sorry, I said. She was a wonderful, wonderful bird and everybody here simply loved her. <laughs> Irreplaceable, he said. I'm sure, I said. So what was your answer, Dudley asked. Will you be having supper with me? It was, yes, I lied, but listen. Why don't I take you to supper at the Brown Derby that night? It's the least I can do. Okay, he said, appeased. When that day arrived and ruddy-faced Dudley came to the stage door in a three-piece suit, it wouldn't have mattered if he'd been diabolically handsome, which I knew he wouldn't be as desirable men never work that hard at courtship. <laughs> we had a very silent lunch chewing loud cob salads at the Brown Derby. It was beyond awkward. Despite being complimented on my performance, I was glutted with every possible nuance of despondency a person could feel. Dudley was not the man to whom I could express it. That's the end of Midge and Dudley. So, that, so that's from your book. Yes, that's uh, chapter 11, I think, in the book. So tell us a little about your book and how it came about. And, oh, and, okay. Um, and then, and we'll, we'll do that, and then after that, we're going to open some questions. All right. I um, have been gathering these stories for quite a while. Uh, I had performed them in a one-woman musical called Odd Woman Out that had been commissioned by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival about eight, nine years ago. And I had done it um, as a stand-up act 
and I had done it as a play with the Jewish Women's Theater uh, with other characters in it. And then a literary agent saw me doing one of the stories called The Baroness of Beverly Hills. And she said, this is a book. It has literary value. It has spiritual heft. And so she helped me get it going. And it took me about a year to write the book um, and organize it. And um, the, the best thing about the book, you know, I had reached a place of great happiness and contentment with myself. I was in therapy. I, um, I had a spiritual quest that I shared with Paul. He was one of my greatest guides. And um, I was feeling pretty good about myself in my 50s because even though acting work was sort of slowing down as it does for women in their 50s, I was beginning to write and I was beginning to get published in humor magazines and chicken soup for the soul books. So I was feeling better and better about myself. And I found that um, a lot of my creativity now came from words doing the, the heavy lifting that my performing body and singing body used to have to do. And I was feeling okay alone with my imagination for the first time. Uh, and I started to feel I was ready to have a relationship and um, I didn't know how to find one. I didn't go to bars. I didn't leave my house very much unless I had an acting job and I just didn't want to date actors or people in show business. So the internet was invented and then online dating began to come to the fore. And I had some girlfriends that were sort of pioneers in it and they were encouraging me. So I tried that. And I think Paul, you know, I had some pretty bad experiences with the online dating. I was seeing one guy for a while who I thought was the end. He was just wonderful person, very sensitive, loved animals. How could you not love a guy that loved animals? He was very protective and courageous, big and strong. And um, then after a short time, I realized that the feral cats he kept adopting were more important in the relationship than I was. One of them would nip me or scratch me and he would comfort the cat instead of me. So I began to see the writing on the wall that I was not going to be prioritized or protected in this relationship. So that slowly had to cease. And then I had another uh, J date, what looked like a triumph with a, a guy in the music industry who was a great catch, very wealthy, very acculturated, very intelligent. And um, we went out one day and he was parking his Land Rover between two other cars. And I heard him scrape and crash into the car behind me. And I said, oh, I think you've hit someone. And he looked at me and he said, do you think we should just take off? And I was stricken. And so while we were stalled there sort of, you know, I was seeing the relationship just kind of disappear. And he thought we were still in the relationship. And he was saying, you know, if we take off now, there'll be no responsibility on anybody's part. And it's just a scratch. And the woman who owned the car walked up and he of course handed his card and said, I'll be responsible for everything, I'm so sorry. And then he looked at me and he said, I should make you pay for this. Oh. And so that relationship deteriorated out of my heart very quickly. And then there was a sad case where I was seeing a guy for, you know, maybe seven, eight months when he was ill for a week. And when we met again, he told me that he had gone into kidney failure and was now on a list for a donor organ. So I kind of clutched my kidneys to myself and slowly had to remove myself from the relationship because I didn't see that I could be the one. I might love him, but I did not see that I could be the one to go through the dialysis and the surgery. And I did stay in touch with him though. And when he had the kidney installed, it rejected him. The organ rejected him. So um, they had to put him on dialysis again, but I stuck with him through this saga and he would put his cell phone up to the, the, the kidney, which I named Sydney. And I say, now Sydney, you got to get going, like get on it, you know, save William's life. And finally it did kick in. So I feel like I did my part in that relationship, even though but, I couldn't bring it. To so me. is it safe to say the book uh, outlines your search for love and meaning or how would you put it? Yes, I would put it that way. <laughs> I was um, very much wanting a, 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 an attachment because my family of origin, they were sort of Teflon for attachment. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like a heart connection enough with my family. There was so much turmoil between my parents, which I talk about a little bit in the book in a lighthearted way, um, that I never really established that primary connection that I learned in therapy is really so paramount to make you uh, able to love, to be independent enough to love. And so after doing a lot of work on myself, I felt worthy and I felt dependable and I felt it was time. 
And it took me a long time. Paul was also at that great uh, event in my life, which was my wedding to a, a terrific yeah. guy. And I, a lot of my final stories in the book are about all the funny things that happened in our courtship that didn't look promising, but ended up being perfect. Because yeah. I'm an odd woman and he was an odd man, but you know, we complimented one another and became even together. Well, I can attest to the fact Stan is an odd man, but you know, <laughs> he's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. He's a psychotherapist. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I, I didn't know you for about 15 years before he ever came along. So, you know, he doesn't know, actually longer than that. That's true. I was at the wedding, it's a great wedding. It really was great. And uh, we had a lot of people there and uh, my, my family couldn't come except for two cousins, but Stan's wonderful family welcomed me in and they are not Teflon for connection. I feel very, very warm, warm and, and, yeah. and feel a lot of care from his family and, and his two wonderful kids, yeah. Ariana and Mark. So I feel very fortunate to have a new family and get married at 65. And I have a new friend, Stan. Yes, and you have a new buddy. A new there, buddy. You have there you go. So listen, man, uh, suppose we open up cyberspace now for some questions from everybody. That'd be all right? Can you sure. mind that? So uh, uh, from what Mel has said and, and what you may have read or whatever, does anyone have a question? Uh, Trish, does that mean you have a question of that thing? Unmute yep. yourself. So Trish yeah. from... Are you from Oakland or Berkeley? You're Oakland. I'm from Oakland, Oakland, California. Hi, Melanie. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. You know, I was thinking about the pandemic and um, you, you've had a lot of life experiences of overcoming. Uh, I mean, being in, in your line of work, there's a definite, a lot of no's to get to yes and a lot of heartbreak, I imagine. And you're hoping for something. And so you've had to learn over the years to deal with it. You've mentioned you've been in therapy and your spiritual journey. And so I wondered what, um, for people who are experiencing something they never planned on, and a lot of them are fighting it, you know, being at home or, or having to reduce their social interactions, do you have any thoughts on how people can heal themselves during this difficult time? Mm -hmm. I, it is a challenge for a lot of my single friends, uh, or a lot of my friends who are trapped in relationships that didn't call for that much closeness. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I have found these Zoom interchanges so, to be so beneficial. I have several meetings a week with the writers group and then with a, a humanitarian social group that have really helped me create a kind of closeness that I feel in my heart, if not in my huggability. Um, so I really recommend, and I have some Zooms I can recommend to folks who want to get more uh, spiritually or heart-wise involved with uh, other groups. I have a lot of those. I also felt fortunate. I was concerned that I would get claustrophobic with my, my relatively new husband, but we've been like Adam and Eve in Eden here. We are fortunate <laughs> to have enough rooms to get away from each other. And we have a lovely yard and he is now doing telehealth. He's a psychotherapist and he's working from our guest house. And I am in my little office here uh, teaching. I, I, I coach a lot of people who want to be more charismatic for their virtual and in-person eventually interchanges. I take all the craft that I've learned as an actor on mic and <laughs> stage and on light and under lights and cameras and help people present themselves to vocally project, to hone their body language so that they are the best spokespersons for themselves and their ideas or their products. So those are things I can offer. Cool. Thank so, you. So uh, Dina has a question. And if you answer it correctly, she'll invite you to our house on Mozart's Vineyard. <laughs> it's very cool. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> also a great photographer. Thanks. Thanks for the plug. And, and um, thanks for inviting me, Paul, to the group. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Um, Melanie, I was, I was looking up um, your posts on Instagram, and I see you were not just connected to the likes of like Raul Julia, but also Gregory Hines. And I just, it made me think, boy, if, if you had an opportunity to work once again with one of the greats, who might it be and, and why? Oh gosh, I have so many idols, Dina. You know, Emma Thompson is one of my idols. Mm -hmm. I certainly love to work off of her. Yeah. Um, in terms of actors, there are so many. I mean, I've gotten to screen test with Robert De Niro and it was like a, having a real experience. It was like we were not in a hotel room with Martin 
crazy condition. We are in an experience. Um, oh, there's so many I'd be honored to work on. There's so many shows that I, I hope I can fit into. Um, one of my challenges has been that I'm a really great ensemble player. Uh, and having been a star in several television series, I'm not very good at the walk-ons that give all the expositions, you know, oh, doctor, she has cancer and she's going to die soon and then leave. I seem to have too, I bring too much uh, life onto the screen, I guess. So there are so many of us ex-series regulars vying for very few roles for older women that Candace Bergen and Meryl Streep and Diane Keaton and getting to do. And mm -hmm. Diana, Diana Wiest is one of my idols. I'd also love to work with her. Wow. So I've got my dreams, but we'll see what the realities get to be. So Dana, did she win? Is she she up for an invite? Oh, of course. Yeah, Dina. Yeah, no, you're in, you're you're invited to my house in Martha's Vineyard too. <laughs> Thank you. What town are you in? <laughs> I'll, be in uh, I'll be in. in is it called Mahansma? Mahansma. Menemsha. Menemsha. Yes, that's it. That's, that's where I'll be. That's my town. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, cool. So, Thanks. so Elliot, what you got? Uh, Melanie, hi. I, I was thinking about your career and the arc of your experience as an actor, and I was wondering about your improvisational self. Could you, could you say something about uh, how you came to that? How did you develop your improvisational skills and abilities? Well, you know, Elliot, I actually started in college. Um, our drama teacher was an alcoholic and she didn't show up for class uh, <laughs> some mornings. So uh, a friend of mine, my friend Donald Walner, uh, who were in the drama department together, were reading books about Viola Spolin. Uh, Viola Spolin had created a stage technique to teach young people how to be self-possessed in public and uh, in, in interacting with others. And so we began to teach improv uh, we were big aficionados of Mike Nichols and Elaine May. We would enact their albums, you know, just for fun. And we both really wanted to get into improvisation. So when I got into New York, I got into some groups, some that performed at local YMCA's in New York. Uh, we would do lunchtime entertainment. People would brown bag and come over and give us scene suggestions and we, we would act them out. And I always had a great character facility because I used to imitate members of the family to make my parents laugh, to get them to stop quarreling. So uh -huh. um, doing characters has always been a real facility for so me. You were, a therapist, you were a therapist as well. Oh, I do a lot of different characters and I've, I've played some on television, like on Parker Lewis Can't Lose, I played this monstrous nightmare of a narcissistic uh, high school principal. And that was one of my most fun roles and other roles in commercials that I've done. And, um, and, and when I was younger, I was very fragmented, you know, because I had so many aspects of myself that I didn't know which one was me. And it wasn't until I was late in my late 20s and I got on Fridays and they had a character named Melanie Chardock, who, who was the newscaster, that I actually committed to being one way. So that character that they gave me became my persona, kind of a professional woman who's trying to keep control and loses it sometimes. And then I had to just write the Bon Mo, you know, that that on-camera character had to sort of keep that character going. But I teach improvisation now. Uh, I use it for charisma purposes. Uh, I teach people how to really be present with one another and go to their emotions rather than their face makings and musculature to make people laugh. I teach people where their funny bones are. We all have them, but some people need some excavating because <laughs> they've been overcompensating for them in some way and hiding them. Thank so, yeah, I love, improvisation will always be a mainstay for me. I owe it everything in my career and my, my, my upcoming writing career. Right. Well, uh, in your book, is, it seems like a, a search for, for the real Melanie, a search for love. And uh, what events in your life, and maybe the book was cathartic in that way, that, that helped you heal and find, if you have, I assume, your true self? I guess we always think we found our true selves, but but what what uh, what things in your life helped you heal? Well, I had a great therapist for twenty years. It was longer than I'd lived with my mother. I think as soon as I had been with my therapist longer than I had been with my mother, I started to get well. And when I learned in therapy, this is kind of so simplistic, but maybe some of you will relate. Um, she would be very quiet. She was not an outgoing person. She would be very quiet in our sessions. And I would panic when she was quiet because I assumed I would project 
that she was judging me or finding fault with me. That was what was in the empty space between me and other people. And so I used to overcompensate and perform, but she wouldn't let me do that. She'd say, what do you want from me right now? And I would say, approval, love, you know, I would have this list and she'd say, just stay still and see what you want. And then I realized I wanted quiet with another person. I wanted another person I could be in a room with mm. without a lot of behavior. Mm. And I think that that was really pivotal for me and I owe her so much. Um, so that when I met the man that would soon become my husband, I had the presence to see him rather than worrying about how I was being seen. That's a good, I like that line. Yeah. Adam, Adam, where'd you go? I think you had a question. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. What, I enjoyed your book, Melanie. Uh, I One thing I was, was <clears throat> both surprising and also a refreshing is that you unapologetically incorporate a relationship, and I see your partner is here, <laughs> but you, you know, uh, incorporate that as part of your emotional goals in life uh, is to find happiness with a partner, which, you know, for younger generations now is like taboo almost. It's like, no, you have to find that completely independently. You, God forbid that should be something that you rely on for, you know, can you kind of talk about that? And have you had any reactions like that to your book? Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I was meeting a lot of young career women and men of every gender, actually. And um, I would say, I just got engaged and I'm 63 years old. And they would say, oh, you give me hope. And um, that was one of the things that motivated me now that I had a happy ending uh, to put it on the book. I could have walked happily into the sunset in chapter 32 at, in love with myself as a writer, as a person. Um, I had been mentoring young women and I felt that my nurturing and my maternal instincts were being put to good use because I didn't get to have my own children. Um, and I was feeling really good about myself for a sustained period of time. And it had nothing to do with a show I was in. It had nothing to do with fan mail, it just had to do with my own company. And so I felt I had a lot to share. I owned my own home, I had my own money. Um, I had my own psyche in control. And then I started again in my 60s to go online and look for love. And um, what can I say? I got lucky. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd had that ache most of my life that many singles have of, yeah, I'm great, but what else? I want to give it to somebody else. I want to say, oh, look at that beautiful sunset to somebody else. And um, on the one hand, I was happy not to have obligations or to worry about anybody but myself. But there was another part of me that felt more generous. I have a lot more to give. So then I started looking in earnest in my early 60s online and got really lucky. And there's wonderful stories about that search in the book. If you buy the book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, uh, $12.99 paperback, the Audible version. Paul, didn't you like the Audible ver version? I loved it because Melanie Lee, uh, reads the uh, Audible version. So she has some different voices. I, I actually thought that was your mother's voice. I think, did you get your mom to say that? <laughs> oh, just when I'm doing her character. Yeah, I do sound like yeah, my yeah. mom. We sound yeah. very much alike. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was D.D. Pickle as your mother. I don't know. But, um, but yeah. I really yeah. enjoyed the Audible. I, 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 I'm a slow reader, so I, I'd rather someone read to me anyway. So I heard you if you uh, interested in Melanie actually reads it. So. Yeah, oh, and you can get it with one click. You don't have to join Audible. You can just go to the Amazon page, if you like, and go to one click so that you only have to buy that one book. Oh, or and you can join for a month and get a freebie. <laughs> you can join for a month and get a freebie, then you listen to other people's books as well. There are many yeah, good books so. out there. I think that's all good. Anybody else have questions? Anybody? Who's that guy, Stan? Oh, him. Does he know how to unmute? There you go. I know you. I know you. <laughs> uh, Melanie, you've been so talented and uh, competent at so many different things, so many different genres. And uh, how has your writing evolved both out of acting as well as 
uh, over the past few years, your writing style as a writer? Well, um, uh, as you can all tell, I love words and I, um, I'm a very wordy person. So when I first started writing, I was writing mostly comedy stuff and it was all very clever and alliterative. I had as many puns as possible per line as I could shove in. And I was uh, performing, you know, puppeteering myself. And I had some success with that, but then I started to get a little sick of myself and I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to be moving people as much as I was moved by others' work. And I realized that my biggest goal is to experience something on the page like I would on the stage so viscerally that other people would experience it with me and have that great escape that good performances or good books can provide. And so I, um, I work with a teacher named Jack Grapes who uh, teaches what's called method writing. I don't study method acting, but method writing with this gentleman was really helpful because it teaches you to go to the core of the pain, whether you're writing comedy or drama and how to assemble it and create it on the page so that others take the trip with you. And I'm still very eager to keep taking people on these trips with me. I have so many stories. People talk about writer's block. I don't see it. I, I have so many thoughts, I can hardly suppress them. Get back to me in a couple of years, but I have so much I want to share with people, uh, fictional as well as non-fictional. And so I think I've become a more spare writer, um, more specific writer. I now see all my extra verbiage as a lot of uh, garbage and camouflage. And so thank you. And your notes have been great, Stan. I have to plug your notes. You might be an editor for somebody one day. Very helpful and economical with your notes. Nick, you have a question? Indeed. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Nick. How are you? I am well. Good to see you. Good to see you. I know, and you know, that there's comedy and there's drama, and there's a thin line between the two. How do you keep your two legs together when you have one leg on each side of the line? <laughs> Nick, by the way, is the chairman of the drama department at the college that I went to, uh, Adelphi University in Long Island, and he's oh. all grown up, and now he's like a professor and the head of the department. It's so wonderful to see you grow up, Nick. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, um, <laughs> please. I do say, um, I do have a passage in the book about that, that in drama, I can really submerge like 90%, 95%. Uh, I love getting so immersed that the, the actual world disappears. And I have superimposed over the actual room, uh, the characters and the places that I'm supposed to be. There's a great pleasure in that. Uh, and taking people along when you are that submerged and viscerally in, engaged. And then with comedy, you know, as an improvisationalist, as a person who directs and, and does other things as well, I've always got one little eye out witnessing what's going on so I can uh, be aware of my timing, be aware of audience response. You know, when I'm on a set without a live audience, I'm aware that I am trying to crack the crew up. It's a goal I've never achieved, but... <laughs> After they stop rolling and they say cut, sometimes they'll crack up and then I know like I'm on the right road. So you've caught me. I have to say that there is a slightly more self-conscious awareness when I'm going broader than deep. Great, thank you now. Uh, thank you. So Jonathan has a uh, question. I just wanted to say Jonathan's originally from New Orleans. And, oh, I can tell, I can tell. Yeah. Well, we didn't <laughs> tell him to wear a costume. This is the way he always dresses. So no, as you can you... tell, I haven't grown up, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Melanie, I was just curious, uh, how is Hollywood recovering after, or what do you see as any kind of recovery after the, not after, but because of the pandemic and all the other negative publicity that's gone on in Hollywood? It's been a tough year, but the uh, production is starting to kick up very carefully. Uh, people have uh, tests every morning before they start their day uh, as, in case evidence has come up during the night. So there is cautious hope. There are auditions uh, on Zoom now that we're starting to be called to. Uh, I know in New York where it's been a little bit more permissive, a girlfriend of mine is doing a series there, uh, kind of a 
a video game oriented television series. It'll be on the internet. And they're tested all the time and they wear masks when they're not on set. I don't know how they handle the intimate scenes. I haven't been invited to any, but um, it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure they've had vaccines. There must be some special dispensation for actors, I'm sorry to say, that gives us, uh, gives us immunity so that we can work closely with other people. Great, thank you. Uh, question there, I think, uh, uh, Stan, is that you? Yeah, is that you, Stan? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. No, speaking of auditions, you have a couple of funny stories I think would be funny, uh, you know, nice to mention. I'm thinking particularly of Betty Buckley and Woody Allen and some of the uh, challenges you've had with auditions. Oh, I remember um, I had seen Betty Buckley in 1776 in 1973 on Broadway and was impressed with what a colossal talent she was. And then I had seen her in What's a Nice Country Like You doing in a state like this, which was an off-Broadway, very political musical review that I later did myself. And then I went to an audition. It was a big singing audition. And I uh, took a number and then she went in first at this audition. And her singing made me cry through the wall, through the door. And I was so moved by her without even watching her that when she came out, they were practically throwing flowers at her. I mean, that's how powerful she was. And I said, well, I guess that that's not going to be my job, but how wonderful you are. Who are you? And I think I've seen you before. And I made a friend that day, which was more important than getting that particular job. And we're still friends today. Uh, we don't see each other as much as we'd like because she's been very busy. But we hope to get together at her ranch in Texas this year since we're both immune, sufficiently immune. I see, a, I foresee for all people our age, by the way, this great partying going on, like of the older people who've been vaccinated. I could just see like orgies up and down the block of only older people. I think this is gonna be our time is how I'm feeling about it now. Vaccinated twice, woo let's go. There you go. And I'd like to point out that uh, uh, we, Melanie and I were Betty Buckley's guests at the opening night on Broadway of Cats. So it was one of the great events of my <laughs> entertainment life. And we yeah. rode around afterwards in uh, Betty's limo and I was assigned the job to run into bars and say, the star of Cats is here. <laughs> and they would just clear a table. So, so yeah. for a night we were kings of Broadway. That was great. Yeah. We had, yes, you, uh, you, when she, she debuted Memory, the song Memory, which is a classic. Oh my God. Now. Oh my God. I think and every, we were there in the first, I met it. I was the only person. I was the only person in the entire audience that wasn't famous, I think. I, I think so, everything. but you looked, you looked famous. <laughs> I looked famous. But, you did. But, you looked like some rich financier at that time with your three piece suit and your white hair. I think you looked. I've very never famous. seen so many famous people in my life in one spot. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Trish, did you have a question? Where, where is that? Yes, um, uh, Melanie, I, this morning I heard a podcast about the subject of fame. Uh, it, it was the, the guy who does Freakonomics. He was talking to a woman about fame because he had, has a certain modicum of fame. And I wondered for you, you've probably had ups and downs, times you were famous, times you weren't, and what your relationship is to that now. Yeah, thanks, Trish. I have a whole chapter about that in, in the book called The Great Unknown where um, you know, the, the show I was on had a kind of a cult following. It wasn't popular, certainly with conservatives. Uh, we were thrown off the air in many Southern cities. So I had pockets of fame, usually in major cities and I'd be welcomed and I'd go there. And one of the most fun things, I didn't really have that many bad experiences um, because the, the fans were kept at bay um, generally outside the gates and people didn't know where I lived. I, I remember coming home on Sunset Boulevard from the studio one night, I was being followed. And so I got in the habit of stopping at the 7-Eleven where all the hookers hung out and seeing if anybody was on my tail. I had this girl, you know, there who would keep watch for me. And she said, oh no, honey, you okay. You go on home now, I'll keep a watch. <gasps> nice tights, by the way. Um, she was like my, my protector and supervisor. I only had a couple incidences of, you know, rabid fandom at too close range where I had to threaten to get a, an attorney disbarred because he kept showing up at my apartment with flowers. Um, 
But uh, then there are other times where you think they recognize you and it's actually somebody behind you. So um, it, it's a strange phenomenon coming on and then coming off. I've seen fame from both sides now and it's been very interesting. That happens to me all the time. Yeah, I, really, I can imagine. I remember we were sitting in an outdoor cafe in Asheville and a bunch of photographers came up. We thought they were shooting you and it was a guy that, that uh, from Smashing Pumpkins was sitting next to us. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? I don't even remember. Right. The most fun thing about being famous was I'd call a 1 800 number to pay a bill, and the person say, Oh, Mel, I love that thing you did last night. And then I'd say, Oh, thanks. They'd recognize my voice or my name. And that, that was really a thrill. And it, you know, it eased kind of the negotiations I had to do with credit card companies. So it was very helpful. Listen, man, we, 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 uh, I just wanted to uh, say we're just about out of time. Um, oh, I just want to read one more story. Yeah, so I was going to ask you maybe you read one more story, if that's okay with everyone. And, uh, and we'll probably be close to wrap it up unless someone has a pressing question or, uh, or need to know where to get the book. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is when I um, had been seeing my, my lovely husband, Stan, for a couple of years and there had been no proposal. And uh, I had said I, I needed a cohabitation agreement if he was going to continue to live with me. I, I wanted to make sure that we understood that this was my house. And we were going through all that kind of pain in the next stuff that couples have to do. And uh, we went to visit my mom uh, in her assisted living facility that I had bought her into, my sister and I had bought her into, uh, to tell her that we were planning to move in together. And we got there late, there had been flight problems and snow problems. And she was very critical of me. Uh, I had been feeling so good about myself, but there's something about being with your mother of origin that kind of fragments you sometimes. You kind of go back into the, you get triggered into this like childhood thing. And I think she said something like, aren't you a little old to be coloring your hair? And I kind of lost my temper for the first time in front of my boyfriend. So uh, he dragged me upstairs. We went to our guest suite on the top floor of the assisted living facility. And uh, he ran a bath for me. I got in the bubble bath and was sitting and stewing. And then he came and got into the tub with me. And he suddenly, in the most unromantic scenario possible, asked me to marry him. So I went through, it felt like hours of reverie of this question put me into a, a terrible state. So I'll just read one little section. On stage and in films, I had walked down four aisles and run headlong down another. Some ceremonies had light and sound men crawling under my feet and hundreds of extras. My actual family was never invited to these weddings. Three of my husbands died, two in comedies and one in a drama, but I didn't mourn long. But it sobered me up just imagining how much anguish is suffered when one loses one's true love. One funny series, a handsome plastic surgeon performed an emergency nose job on my character when she fell face first. And then he proposed to the results of his nose job as soon as she healed. After he keeled over dead during our wedding ceremony, the writers wrote me a rebound wedding to another man who died on our honeymoon in Hawaii. Out of pity for me, that show's costume designer slipped this still single middle-aged spinster one of the beautiful wedding gowns to keep. Gorgeous, cut to fit me. I thanked him fervently. Bill, I said, I'm going to wear this gown one day for real. Of course you are, dear, he said, patting my old maid hand. I had kept that gown wrapped in plastic in my closet like Miss Havisham in Great Expectations for 25 years now. I would take it out to look at it every few years and renew my vow to wear it. I'd save a thousand dollars if I did. Would I finally get to take her out and put her on for real? I rehearsed all the feelings of love in so many stories for so many years. I wondered if that show would ever open. Long had I longed for a commitment for life rather than a flimsy contract for the run of show. Had I pined for a real ceremony after which no one yelled, cut. And now my first non-actor had asked me, could this really be happening here and now? How could anybody ask to marry a woman wearing nothing but glasses and a shower cap in a bathtub at an old age home? He must be crazy. Or could it be that he really loves me? 
So you'll have to find that out in the book, which is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And uh, if you buy the book and send me proof of purchase at my email address, playdate444 at gmail.com, I will autograph and personalize this bookmark postcard, maybe coaster, um, to you and mail it to you. So just send me proof of purchase and I'll send you this uh, autograph bookmark because we can't get together and actually have a book signing. Folks, I don't know about you, but I certainly enjoyed it and I hope everyone did. And I just wanted to really thank Melanie for, for taking the time and for all the joy you brought to the world and the humor and the wisdom of your book. And, uh, and uh, unless there's something else pressing, I think we can say goodbye. Do you want to have any last comment before the curtain goes down? Paul, yeah. um, for the rest, I'm Lucy Allen. Um, am I unmuted? Yes, Lucy. Yes, you are. Are you? Okay. Uh, I'm headed to Barnes and Noble in a day or so, and definitely that will be going for your book. So this was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I so appreciate meeting you. Thank you, everybody who I don't know. You all seem like so much fun. I hope I get to actually interface with you sometime somewhere. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you, Kitty. It was.